Today is communion, so please take some time to gather up a bread-like item as well as a juice-like item. It could be anything. It could be a cookie or it could be some Mountain Dew. It doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that there's a whole community of people watching this right here, right now. And we're all going to take communion together a little bit later in this service. So wherever you are, whether you're in a room with 20 people or you're all by yourself, you are never alone because we are here with you. And let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you that we're gathered together all across this nation, all across the world. There's people viewing your service, Lord. And we pray for one another and we take heart that we're not alone. We remember your sacrifice, Lord, on this day. It's your most holy name we pray. Amen. Welcome once again to St. Paul's Church. My name is Andrew Bible, and there's a QR code on my face, isn't there? Okay, so you can connect with us 
by simply taking your phone and scanning this QR code, which apparently won't leave my face. <laughs> Some of you would say that's an improvement, I suppose. <laughs> Ah, finally, it's down where it's supposed to be. In all seriousness, though, we want to know who's out there in Internet land. So please scan that code. Let us know you're here. And let us know how we can pray for you. If you happen to be watching on your phone at this very moment, you can always go to stpauls.faith and connect with us the old-fashioned way. <laughs> we look forward to getting to know you. And now, sadly, we need to share with you that our longtime friend and brother in Christ, Pete Snyder, has passed away. He was 83 years old. You are cordially invited to Pete's Celebration of Life service, which will be held on Tuesday, June 8th at 11 a.m. here at St. Paul's Church. A public family visitation time will be from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. prior to the service. The service will be live-streamed on the church's YouTube channel for those unable to attend in person. So during this difficult time, please keep the family in your thoughts and prayers. And as is our custom here, we will take a brief moment of silence for Pete. Let's thank the Lord for this great man of faith. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift you gave us in Pete. We thank you for the impact he had on this earth. And Lord, we thank you that we had an opportunity to get to know him. He is with you now, Lord. And we pray for those that knew Pete, that you can instill your peace upon them. It is in your most holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen. And lastly, thank you, St. Paul's. We say it every week, and every week you continue to put your faith in God and His ministry here with your tithes and offerings. In this tumultuous time, it'd be easy not to take that leap of faith and easily understood if he didn't. But God is doing special things here. And he is using each and every one of you, whether you realize it or not. So thank you for your partnership, as we could not do this without you. And most importantly, let's thank him for guiding us in the right direction. Dear Heavenly Father, this has been a crazy, crazy year and a half. But our faith in you, Lord, supersedes that because you're not limited by the things we limit ourselves by. You're not limited by anything in this world. And we thank you that you've given us this direction, Lord, to take these tithes and offerings and use them for your work. And we pray and we continue with excitement of what that's all going to look like. It's in your most holy name we pray. Amen.
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, hello and welcome once again to St. Paul's Church. We're so glad that you're joining us for this online worship service. Thank you for being here. My name is Matt Skillen. I'm one of the pastors here and it's my humble joy and honor to share God's word with you today. Before we begin, I'd just like to open with a few words of prayer. Well, gracious God, we know that in everything that we do, you are authoring everything around us, even our steps, Lord. We pray now that your word would speak truth to us, that we would see great possibility and potential in the lives that we lead, Lord, in the work that you're doing in our lives. Let our eyes and ears, minds and hearts be open for the message that you have for us today. These things we pray in your name, amen. Well, if you've been tracking with us throughout this season, you know that we have been in the midst of a sermon series called Blessed for Chaos. This actually is our final installment of that sermon conversation and what a journey it has been. Together, we've looked at who Jesus calls to be a disciple and how he teaches them. We've also looked in Matthew 5 at the Beatitudes, the very characteristics of a disciple of Jesus Christ. We've embarked on this journey together in Blessed for Chaos because we believe that no matter how chaotic the world becomes, no matter what might be going on in our lives or in the world around us, we are equipped and forged to be a light for Christ amid all of it. Thank you for being with us on this journey and for embarking on this uh, sermon series that we've called the Be uh, Blessed for Chaos where we've looked at the Beatitudes together. These uh, sermons have equipped us and challenged us to be ready for whatever might be ahead. As we continue through this message series, though, I, it's important to point that the guidance that Jesus is sharing with his disciples in the Beatitudes is meant to transform them, knowing full well that each disciple would go forth and lead others through a similar transformation. The very fact that you and I are actually experiencing this worship service right now, that it's connected to a church, is evidence that many of the disciples decided to go forward, to live out the Beatitudes, to make new disciples, and to encourage them to make new disciples as well. We are living in the greatest movement in history, and we're called to continue that tradition. 
to go into, on a discipling journey like so many before us and to invite others to come along with us. In the scripture reading that you've heard throughout this sermon series, you have heard all of the Beatitudes read to us in Matthew 5. Each one identifies a unique marker. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Remarkable. The final beatitude, the last characteristic listed in this deeply important lesson that Jesus shares with his disciples found in Matthew 5, 10 verse Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted? <laughs> this one's tough because I think it goes against everything we would ever want in life. If you're like me, I just want to be liked. <laughs> and it's hard for me to imagine what it would feel like if someone was purposefully reviling or, or persecuting me. In fact, I, I don't think any of us watching this sermon right now on the screen, woke up this morning and say, maybe today, maybe today is the day that someone's going to make a false claim about me or say something mean about me or call me out and single me out and isolate me because they don't like me. <laughs> if that's you, if you actually woke up this morning thinking that, uh, give me a call or send me an email. Let's, let's talk more about why you would want to uh, have that as a goal for your day and why you may, may not want to be liked so much. You know, on the rare occasion where um, I have felt persecuted directly, and, and those moments, I think, have been so few and far between, I got to be honest, I didn't feel blessed, as the Bible says. And I certainly didn't feel as though I should be rejoicing or feeling glad about it. But here in the Word of God, in the very red letters that Jesus spoke himself, in this truly important message to his disciples, it says that persecution, specifically for righteousness sake, is a blessing. And, and did you notice the word choice in this passage? It doesn't say if people revile you and persecute you. It says when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So what we can gather from this one piece of scripture is that on this journey, in this effort to live in this life for Jesus Christ, while sharing his good news with others and choosing to live life according to his characteristics in the Beatitudes, Jesus is telling us that we will be persecuted. We will be reviled. People will make false and evil claims about us just as it was for the saints of old, so too will it be for us, for our reward is great in heaven. Now, if we can just pause here for a moment and, and look around us. It's probably no surprise to many that if we look from generation to generation here in the United States, there is a noticeable decline of Christian influence all around us. But violent persecution of Christians in the United States, it doesn't happen too often. It, it does happen, but not on a regular daily basis are we reading headlines in the newspaper about Christians being persecuted. However, in other parts of the world, it does exist. And, it's, it, and it happens almost every day. Throughout these past couple of weeks, I've been reading harrowing stories of people living in China, Sudan, and Iraq 
who have been mistreated. They've been imprisoned, beaten and killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Father Douglas Albazi, for example, is a priest in Iraq who has continued to lead a congregation of faithful believers in light of tremendous persecution at the hand of the Islamic terror organization known as ISIS. I'd like to share just a brief clip of his story that he told in 2018 to the Billy Graham World Summit on Christian Persecution. Listen to how Father uh, Al-Bazi explains how persecution happens at his church. We are Christian from, you know, the first century. As a people, we are proud as, you know, Iraqi and Christian. We are suffering not just a couple of years ago. ISIS is just one face of the devil. We are facing with the same devil 14 century ago. I know Muslim very well. One time they blew up my church. They attacked me and was uh, during the, the mass. One time I got shot in my leg. Still the bullets in, in my leg, the left. And I've been kidnapped for nine days. It was Sunday after the morning mass. I was kidnapped by one of the militia. They were armed with a Kalashnikov and immediately opened the window and they say, if you are going to, to do anything, we will shoot you immediately. They opened the door and they took me. In hearing Father al story, I have to admit, I don't know how I would respond. I'm reminded that we live in a truly remarkable place where you and I can gather uh, you know, and share ideas over the internet about our religious faith without fear of someone knocking down our door and arresting us, without fear of persecution or threat of terroristic violence. In any event, I think we can actually learn a lot from Father Albazi and his story, just as we can learn a great deal from Jesus' teaching and the lives of the saints from so long ago, those who have been persecuted for their faith. You know, while our stories are not their stories, and we will likely never encounter what they've encountered, we can still learn a lot from them, particularly how they respond to persecution, how they might respond to what other people might call their enemies. Those who have been persecuted, falsely accused, because they are representing Christ in their community and world. They are blessed. Their reward for their persecution here on earth will truly be in heaven. Have you ever thought about how you might respond to a situation where you are being persecuted? How might you feel? Who would you call? A, perha a, a pastor, perhaps? How might you react? Well, after reading the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12, you might start searching the Bible for guidance on how to respond when persecution finds you. In your search, you wouldn't have to look very far, as it turns out. By scanning through the remainder of Matthew 5, you'll see additional guidance that Jesus provides on this idea of how to react when facing persecution. In Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. <laughs> well, as we've said several times throughout this message series, Jesus came to show us a new way to live. His new way reorders everything that we would have ever thought or known in this life. And it was an attempt actually to realign our hearts to the heart of God. In what could be a very cute, uh, confusing piece of guidance, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When every fiber of your being wants to retaliate to, on those who have been harmful to, to us and to our families, Jesus says we should pray. What would it mean to us if we prayed for our enemies? How might that change our perspective? How might that change our hearts? 
Every entry in the Beatitude message doesn't aim to change the world. Jesus provides this message to transform individual hearts. There are those in the world, and there will always be those in the world who do things that hurt and confuse us. They will miss our expectations and they will break our hearts. And yet Jesus, <laughs> Jesus died for them too. Instead of telling the, his disciples everything that they wanted to hear about how bad and unkind the world can be, Jesus encourages his disciples to look inward, to transform, and to be a guiding light to others. The transformed hearts of Christ followers, as we've seen throughout the ages, has a replicating effect. And that is where real change begins and where the movement of Christ continues here on earth. So how might we be blessed in persecution? How might we bless others that persecute us? Why might we, be, why might we pray for our enemies and those who would do us harm? When people hurt us, actually, it's, it's very likely that they're operating and acting from a sense of pain or uncertainty. If you've been a part of St. Paul's for quite some time, you might've heard us say this before in our messages. And that's this, hurt people, hurt people. In the midst of our shock and dismay from being singled out and persecuted by someone else, if we can take a breath before we react or retaliate, understanding this principle that hurt people, hurt people, may give us a new perspective to work with. The guidance to pray for our enemies and bless those who persecute us is a purposeful piece of advice provided by Jesus in Matthew 5. Because praying instead of retaliating changes our posture. When we take the posture of prayer, we are, are literally changing the state of our bodies and our minds to appeal to God instead of taking the next available opportunity to get back at someone or to retaliate. When we pray for those who harm us, another important thing that happens is that we resist bitterness. Try it. It is literally impossible to stay uh, angry and to grow bitter against someone if you're praying for them. You might grit your teeth and clench your fists and say, God, I really want you to help that person. But if you notice that as you continue to pray, a softness will move into your heart. Now, a common question that I get or a common, a, a common concern that I hear from others when I share this advice is that they'll say, but, but Pastor Matt, I, I can't possibly pray in those moments. I feel so angry. I don't, I don't know if I can pray when I'm that angry. As if you might offend God somehow if you appeal to him when, you, when you're mad at someone. You know, the response that I have to that common concern is that Jesus Christ, while dying on the cross, took on all the sin and ugliness of the world. Our God is big and he is certainly big enough to handle your anger. When you can convince yourself to begin praying for those that have harmed you, those who have hurt you, those who have persecuted you, you'll begin to feel hope to move in where anger was once trying to set up shop. The Apostle Paul encouraged the Roman church to bless their enemies. He wrote these words to the Roman church while he was in prison. He was imprisoned, by the way, for being a disciple of Jesus Christ. If anyone had an opportunity to not share this particular guidance, to to, uh, to, to move on beyond just this simple notion that we should continue to bless our enemies, it would have been the Apostle Paul. 
And he instructed the young church in Ephesus to put aside all bitterness, to put aside all wrath and anger. Why? Because we're not called to anger. We're not called to wrath. We're not called to retaliation. We're called to love. We're called to, to grace. Praying for your enemies, by the way, is unexpected. It's the unexpected thing. If someone is going out of their way to do you wrong, they are preparing for you to retaliate, to, to, to take it to a whole nother level, to do something to them far worse than they have done to you. How do you think they might respond if instead you decided to pray? How might they respond if instead of retaliation, they received a blessing? And how might others who are observing this whole thing play out as innocent bystanders respond to your reaction? Well, the second part of uh, Father Albazi's story, there's an important lesson for all of us. The persecuted pastor from Iraq has a message that I think will change our perspective on the power of persecution. After nine days, they released me. I remember when I reached our church highway, so the priest was outside. When he hugged me that time, I started to cry. And he told me, never mind, you are okay. To me, I forgive them. That forgiveness is the gate to understand what's been the grace of God. We have to forgive because to let the grace transfer from generation to generation. If not, that means the pain and the hate will close the way to the grace of God. You have to take care about kids. They are the future. The Islamic State, the ISIS, they destroyed all our villages and houses. Now we became one house. They destroyed all our churches. Now we became one church. So thank you, because Jesus united us again. We are still that salt in the food. Without us, it's gone. Without forgiveness, that's mean asking for revenge will be acceptable. But forgiveness, that's mean it's over. So what I am asking here, it is to forgive them. We have to forgive. Forgive them. <laughs> what the ISIS terrorists had planned for evil, God has restored for good. As a result of ongoing persecution, the church in Iraq is united. They are united in the belief that they are serving the one true God. By forgiving their pursuers, they have opened the gate of grace that has served as a timeless example of the tremendous love that we receive through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And if today, if, if, if you're wondering what you might do when, not if, but when, you encounter persecution, my prayer is that you'll remember this simple guidance. Forgive. And when you can't forgive, pray. This is really tough stuff. It is the sincerest hope, however, of our Heavenly Father that bitterness and anger 
not fill your heart. Because when your heart is full of these things, it crowds out things that are most important, like, like compassion, like, like patience, hope, love, and joy. And most importantly, peace. Matthew 5.10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In every blessing, in every persecution, in every broken heart and joyous reunion, God is shaping your heart. He is transforming you in every possible way so that our hearts, your heart, my heart, they become more like his. For some watching this worship service online, there's going to be a big transformation coming today. If you know in your heart that, that you have s someone to forgive, someone who has castigated or reviled you in some way or, or someone who has singled you out and isolated you, I don't know the circumstances, but I do know that God wants to transform your heart. If that's you, I'd like to pray for you right now. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, we know that you are the God that heals. And try as we might to surrender everything to you, there are places of our hearts sometimes that we keep to ourselves. So Lord, I pray that whoever is watching this message right now that they invite you in. They take this opportunity to forgive the person or the persons who have persecuted them, who have hurt them, and that those edges that we've kept to ourselves would be softened and your righteousness moves in. as we continue into a moment of prayer, maybe you've never said yes to Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? <laughs> Jesus is the son of God. When he came to live on earth, he truly became our God with us. He lived a normal life that was extraordinary. He died on a cross, but his death meant so much more. While on the cross, he, he died for your sins and my sins. What are sins? Sins are the things that we do that separate us from, from God. And the price of those sins is pretty tremendous. But through Jesus's death, we were forgiven. And if you believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God, if you believe that, that he died for your sins, and if you believe that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says that you will be saved saved from the sins that we've committed, saved from the things that, that we've done that, that we're not proud of and the things that we would never tell another person. We're saved from an eternity in hell. If you would like to know that kind of salvation, here in a moment, we're going to say a special prayer. And, and I invite you to say that with me. In this moment, you can say, Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I know that I need to be saved. Forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. You know my heart. It is yours. Amen and amen. If you said that prayer for the very first time, we would love to hear from you. Send me an email. Reach out to the church office in some way. We would love to be able to connect with you. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to celebrate uh, and take a moment to remember our salvation through the Holy Sacrament of Communion. 
We hope that you've gathered some elements that you can use to take communion with us. And uh, we'll begin with uh, taking a look at, nope, trying again. I messed it up. You ready? We're going to try one more time. You ready? Okay. As we continue our worship, we're going to take an opportunity to share communion with one another. Communion is a holy sacrament that reminds us to remember our salvation through Jesus Christ and the great sacrifice that he made on the cross for our sins. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the loaf, he gave thanks, and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat, and when you do, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for your sins and the sins for all. Take and drink, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for these elements and what they represent. Though we are not worthy of this meal, you invite us to the table to partake and to remember. And so, Lord, may your Holy Spirit pour down on these elements and the elements that are being used across this worship service. For us, may they become the body and blood of Christ. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Well, as you've gathered the elements, we invite you now to share them with those that you are with. If you are on your own, don't worry. You are never alone. We're going to be taking communion with you. As you take the bread that you've selected and set aside, say these words, the body of Christ broken for me. And as you take the cup, say these words, the blood of Christ shed for my sins. Okay. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do in our lives and we thank you for this opportunity to reflect on your body and your blood that was traded for our salvation. Lord, as we go through our days ahead, remind us of the great work that you are doing in all of our lives. Let us be reminded of the great impact that we have for you here on earth. May we be a light to everyone that we meet so that your will, not ours, will be done. These things we pray in your gracious name. Amen and amen. Well, friends, we thank you for joining us for, for this online worship service. May the grace and peace that surpasses all understanding be with you today and until we meet again.